each other this morning as the choir sings. sing together this morning. Great and mighty. Great and mighty is the Lord our God. Great and mighty is He. Great and mighty is the Lord our God. Great and mighty is He. Lift up your banner, let the anthems ring. Praise is to our King. Great and Welcome all of you here this morning to the services. I trust you've had a great week, and hopefully you've uh, come today in order to worship and be able to get some batteries recharged and get ready to go out and 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 tackle another week. And so, but it is good to see you here today, especially if you are a guest today. Thank you for coming. And uh, if you ask you would remember Jason Stringer, and he is uh, needs our prayers, and also Fred Dubasan. These are a couple of folks we've added to our prayer list this morning, and there's a lot of folks that um, needs prayer. But we uh, would like to just rejoice. Uh, with what God has done yesterday. We've had a great uh, women's conference here yesterday. It was awesome, and uh, God bless with that. We are thankful for that, and a lot of folks are on a high right now because of great things happened there. I'm going to ask Brother Pud Stringer to ask God's blessings over these names, and specifically one of our Southern Baptist missionaries in Russia who has been arrested. We've been praying this week for him, but we want to um, ask Sets Pud is. He's very mission-minded, but remember, if you would, remember... Uh, a lot of these are not named because of their safe security, but we do have a, a, a missionary that is uh, in situation. He needs your prayers this morning. So, put if you will. Before Brother Evan comes, there's some announcement I wanted to make and uh, some things that I wanted to sort of, I guess, push as a pastor, as we say. Uh, homecoming is coming. Brother 
Um, Lewis Zink is going to be coming back to share God's Word, so don't forget about that. That's about two weeks out, the first Sunday of October, so looking for a big day there. And uh, also, the, in the foyers here and here in the area, there's a sign-up sheet. Uh, there's going to be an enhanced carry class uh, as far as like a handgun enhanced carry. You have to be 21 years of age or older uh, to be able to go through that class, and it's $60. Uh, to be able to do that. Uh, so anyway, uh, you have more questions, you can uh, talk to our sec um, safety committee. I believe it's the way it's listed. I try, try to call it security, but anyway. And uh, Ben White is uh, the chairman of that, and he could give you more information on that. Um, but also, uh, Brother Evan, if you will, if you'll come, and uh, there's other things we'll let you know along the way. All right, good morning. Now we can do just a little bit better than that, right? Good morning. There we go. All right, y'all are awake and alive this morning. That is amazing. All right, just got a couple of announcements for y'all this morning. Of course, uh, immediately following the worship so service this morning, um, all ladies that are participating in the Jesse Tree Advent Experience needs to meet down here in the front of the sanctuary just for a few minutes after this morning's worship service. At 4 o'clock today, there is a fellowship hall committee meeting in the conference room. And, of course, tonight after our evening worship, we have a homecoming committee meeting in the, uh, in the conference room as well. So a lot of meetings going on today. Also a lot of meetings going on this week, I suppose. Uh, Wednesday, this upcoming Wednesday, we are going to have a children's committee meeting at 5.30 in the conference room, followed by a prayer meeting at 6.30, and, of and then choir practice, choir practice is going to take place after church that night. So Wednesday night, y'all are going to have choir practice immediately after church. Saturday, September 24th at 6.30 a.m., the Marion County Brotherhood will leave the association office. They're going to go to Crosby, Mississippi to work on a, some of the flood-damaged houses. We were told specifically this morning that they are going to be putting up sheetrock. So if you are a professional sheet rocker, or if you have never put up sheetrock in your entire life, this weekend is going to be a great opportunity for you to come and learn and to be the hands and feet of Jesus as we uh, minister to people whose, whose homes were damaged by the, the flooding over the past couple of months. <coughs> mm. All right. Also, as Brother Tim said, we do have homecoming. That is a Sunday, October 2nd, the first Sunday in October. And Brother Lewis Zink is going to bring the morning message, and we will meet in the fellowship hall after that with a covered dish. So everybody bring a covered dish that morning. And it's going to be a great, great, great homecoming. All right. Also, this morning in Sunday school, we had, oh, let me see if I remember the number. I don't think I do. 167 present in Sunday school this morning with 12 visitors and 13 in our phone ministry class. This morning, I would like to just read to you a piece of God's Word from the book of Ephesians. Something I've kind of been doing um, at night before I go to bed is just kind of going verse by verse through the book of Ephesians and just kind of praying through it and seeing how it applies. And some the Lord just kind of recently revealed to me a couple of days ago. Um, you know, no matter how many times we study God's Word and we reread through God's Word, there's always something kind of new that, that appears fresh to us. You know what I'm saying? And so a couple of nights ago, I was reading through the first chapter. And right here, uh, beginning in, let's say, verse 16. The Apostle Paul writes, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, that you may know what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and that you may know what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his great might that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. And then he goes into this, this brief description of the the power of Christ and the glory of God. He says, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. 
and he put all things under his feet, being Jesus, he put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. One of those words that the Apostle Paul uses, the immeasurable greatness. And you try and you, you try and grasp that with our minds, and, and I find that I, I just can't. I can't grasp the immeasurable greatness, but I know that at the epitome of God's greatness, we have the crucifixion and the resurrection in which we see sinful humanity redeemed before a righteous and just and loving God. And that, my friends, is worthy of praise this day and all the rest of our days. So may we offer up a word of prayer to our God this morning. Lord, we come before you, and you are the very definition of the word immeasurable power, immeasurable grace, immeasurable love, glory, honor. God, you are above all, you are in all, and you are through all. And God, we are so thankful that even today you are still calling us to follow you. You are still calling us to make a difference. You are still calling us to be bold in the name of Jesus. You are still calling us to reach out and to love and to step past our comfort zones and to reach those who are hurting. And you are still calling us. And God, we are so thankful that you do. God, you could have left us right where we were, and you would have been perfectly justified in doing so because we deserved condemnation. But you and your grace brought us out of the condemnation by the crucifixion and the resurrection of your son. We know of your love. And God, I pray that we would be bold in proclaiming it. God, I pray that we would trust in you deeper. God, I pray that our hearts and our minds and our eyes and our voices would be yours fully yours. God, I pray that our families would be yours. I pray that our bank accounts would be yours. God, I pray that our time would be yours because, God, you deserve every single bit of it. God, I pray that you convict us where we fail you. I pray that you draw us closer to you as a result. God, I pray that we grow in grace towards you every single day. We thank you so much for your word, Father. We thank you so much that you hear our prayers. And God, I pray that you would be in this place this morning. Lord, that you would draw your saints to you. Lord, that you would convict the sinner of their sin. And God, that you would redeem and restore a broken and hurting people. God, we thank you so much for Jesus. We thank you so much that he bore our sins upon the cross that we may know you in a deep and personal way. And it's by his name, the name that is above every name that has ever been named or will ever be named, that I pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Well, good morning again. Before we do birthdays, recognize them, I want to do something this morning. If you're in 7th grade through 12th grade, I want you to stand this morning. <clears throat> Go ahead. Amen. It, isn't that a blessing in the balcony? There's a lot in the balcony, too. Amen. Y'all can be seated. I just wanted to recognize y'all. I, I noticed a lot of youth in here today, and it's a blessing. It's kind of scary, but they're going to be our leaders one day. So, But, uh, and no, it's a blessing to have the young people here. Thank y'all for coming to church and in God's house this morning. Birthdays this week. Tyler, step, come on up. No, you can just, no, not Tyler. Oh, okay, you just pat him. Okay, Tyler's looking at me like I'm crazy. <laughs> Who had a birthday this morning or this week? Miss Beth, thank you for your honesty, Miss Beth. Who? Hallie. We got her. We got when? We got you last week. Is that right? Okay. I'm going to leave that one alone. Who else? Just two? Who had an anniversary this week? That's a blessing. Nobody? Well, let's sing to these this morning. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, God bless you. Happy birthday to you. Amen. 
As we continue in worship, we'll sing hymn number 91, 102, and 127. You can remain seated. Oh. 
stand together for our offertory hymn, hymn number 229. We'll sing the first, second, and last of Are You Washed in the Blood. Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you fully trusting in His grace? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood in the soul? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Lay aside the garments that are stained with sin, and be washed in the blood of the Lamb. There's a fountain flowing for the soul unclean. Oh, be washed in the blood of the Lamb. Are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Let's pray. Father, thank you for this opportunity to come in and worship in your house today. May it come the time to get back to your, to your worship, to your sanctuary church. May it use as your need be ones on the prayer list and not look the left hand as one brother Tim had mentioned be with them and be with brother Tim as he bring the message today in Jesus name we pray amen Amen.
Amen. Thank you, ladies. We're going to have a time of favorite hymns this morning. We'll do ever how many we can this morning. So grab a hymn book and tell me your favorite hymn. Amazing Grace. One oh four. sing the fifth verse, fifth verse. When we've been there ten thousand years, bright shining as the sun. here somewhere 473 I am weak but thou art strong Jesus, keep me from all wrong. I'll be satisfied as long as I walk. Let me walk close to thee. Just a closer walk with thee. Granted, Jesus is my plea. Daily walking close to Thee, let it be, dear Lord, let it be. We had another one in the center here. Seventy-seven. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord Almighty, for my soul longs and even faints for you. For here my heart is satisfied, Within your presence, I sing beneath the shadow of your wings. Better is one day in your courts, better is one day in your house, better is one day in your courts than thousands elsewhere. Better is one day in your courts, better is one day in your house, better is one day in your courts than thousands elsewhere, than thousands elsewhere. 
601. Some glad morning when this life is o'er, I'll fly away to a home on God's celestial shore. I'll fly away. Time for two more. 160, 162 and and six. 162, then we'll go to 63. 162. Wonderful, merciful Savior. Precious Redeemer and friend, who would have thought that a lamb could rescue the souls of men? Oh, you rescue the souls of men. Counselor, Comforter, Keeper, Spirit we long to embrace. You offer hope when our hearts have hopelessly lost the way. Oh, we've hopelessly lost the way. You are the one that we praise. You are the one we adore. You give the healing and grace. Always hunger for. Oh, oh, our hearts always hunger for. And you said 63? Is that right? Okay. Our God, let's go, let's see what we got here. That's all right, first one. Here we go, let's sing it through twice. Our God is an awesome God, he reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an awesome God. Amen. Thank you. just like to, um, <clears throat> some of you may be wondering about Mr. Woody um, Stringer, Woodrow, his real name, but we all called him Woody, and um, he was kin to a lot of folks in these parts, and uh, he passed away, y'all know he's a Walmart greeter, and um, he his funeral service is going to be 2 o'clock this afternoon, come over at Hawthorne, and the term it's going to be at Lot, and then they're going to have the feeding for the family immediately following this, the middle service uh, this afternoon. So if you would be in prayer for Woody's family and his passing. And uh, he had a bad heart, but it was somewhat of all of a sudden thing for him. But anyway, he'll be greatly missed. I'm going to be uh, officiating that service. I only minister there that's going to be doing that. And so if I appreciate your prayers as I do that this afternoon. 
um, he's a real good friend of mine, and uh, we're going to miss him greatly. If you have your Bibles, let's turn into the book of Psalm 107 and verse 1 through 9 today. Psalm 107 and verse 1 through 9. Is this mic'd up enough? Can y'all hear me back in the back with this? Sound like it needs to be just a little bit, maybe. Um, we've been going through a series of messages, and it's about questions that we all ask. And this is the last message on the series. Um, we will be going in a different direction next week and following. And, uh, but how, uh, how to live a life of satisfaction. And uh, this message is, is hard for me to, to preach today because this one probably is more for me than it is anybody in the place. Um, how to live a life of satisfaction. Sometimes it's hard to be, it's like Paul said, find satisfaction basically in the circumstances that you're in or in life. And so it's hard to sometimes find, find that fine place to be in and satisfaction. But we're going to try to look in Psalm today in 107. We'll read that in just a few minutes, uh, in just a few moments from now. You know, a lot of people can make a lot of money, but does money really make you happy? Uh, you can have all the money in the world, and a lot of people think the more they get, uh, the more happy they will be. And when they find out, not necessarily is the case, that the more money you get, well, you sometimes bring dissatisfaction by the more you get. And that's the way that we are in our country. We have that mindset, if we, get, if we can get more money, we will be satisfied. Or if I do this certain thing, I will be satisfied. If I get this certain degree, I'll be satisfied. But how do you live a life of satisfaction? Uh, in Psalm 107, verses 1 through 9, uh, it, it speaks about this. And we're, we're going to give our very best shot today in, in looking at this. You know, there's a lot of football players that play in the NFL and make a lot of money. And one of those football players placed in New England Patriots. And during back years ago, back in 07 8, and during the regular season, their quarterback, of course, Tom Brady, and he was just blowing up scoreboards and setting all kind of records and things like that. And, and he won the Most Valuable Player Award. And he was at the age of 30. At that point, he had already accomplished a lot. He had won three Super Bowls. And he seemingly was set apart as one of the best ones to ever go down in history as a quarterback, uh, besides the Manning Bunch. And and so we find that Tom Brady, he asked the question, and back in 05, Tom Brady was interviewed by 60 Minutes journalist Steve Croft, and despite all of the fame and the, all the accomplishments that he has actually achieved, this guy, he talked to him, Brady talked, told this uh, guy from 60 Minutes that it felt like that there was just something missing in his life. And this is what he said. He said, why do I have three Super Bowl rings and still there's something greater out there for me. It seems like that would be the case. I mean, maybe there's, maybe a, a lot of people would say, hey, man, uh, uh, that's what it's all about. I reach my goal. I reach my dream. I, uh, but me? He said, I think it's got to be more out there than that. I mean, this just cannot be all that there is. I mean, all that it's cracked up to be. And so this interviewing guy, Croft, he pressed Tom Brady as to what, the right answer would be and he didn't know what the answer was he said I wish I knew he said I love playing football and I love being quarterback for this team but at the same time I think that there's a lot of other parts about me that I'm trying to find how many of you can relate to Tom Brady's desire for more it may not be more physical maybe more spiritual on the one hand most of us we have everything that we possibly could need most of us Every one of us in this place, more than likely, we have a whole lot more than a lot of people in other countries, for sure. And we've been very blessed. We say, well, you know, I don't have a lot. By American standards, we may not have a lot. But if we took a good look at a lot of the third world countries, we'd have to say that most of us are rich by comparison. And some of us, are, we, the people struggle financially or all other kind of ways. But I'd have to say that most of the people that I meet, they struggle more with living spiritually and emotionally and they're running on empty and even those people who call themselves Christians they have to admit that there are some days in their life if not most days they f live their life feeling unsatisfied and I believe the psalmist had some very important insight to this teaching here exactly what we're talking about today notice what it said in Psalm 107 and verses 1 through 9 oh give thanks to the Lord for he is good for his loving kindness is everlasting. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. 
whom he has redeemed from the hand of the adversary and gathered from the lands, from the east and from the west and from the north and from the south. They wandered in the wilderness in a desert region. They did not find a way to an inhabited city. They were hungry and thirsty. Their soul fainted within them. And then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them out of their distress. And he led them also by a straight way to go to an inhabited city. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his loving kindness, for his wonders to the sons of men. For he has satisfied the thirsty soul, and the hungry soul he has filled with what is good. Naturally, those last two verses is where we're going to camp out at for a while. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. And so, there are three steps here that I would like for us to look at briefly this morning, if you will, on our quest for satisfaction. First of all, we need to stop, recognize the depth of what God has done for you. What has God done for you in your life? You know, once we begin to see clearly what God has done for us and how much that God actually cares for us and the, I believe the feelings of emptiness, it'll start to go away a little bit because you realize you've been a blessed person. But until we recognize these truths, we're going to always be looking for more. And so we need to stop and recognize what God's done for us. But you know what? We need to recognize that God is good. The psalmist tells us that we should give thanks to the Lord for He is good. Now let's put this thing in perspective here. Can you think of one person whose life that you could look at and if you know everything about them, you could honestly, you think about that person's life, you can honestly say that they were good in the sense of the word that is used right here in this passage. When the Bible talks about God being good, it's, it's referring to him as being perfect in every way. I don't know about you, but I don't know anybody that's perfect in every way. I know a number of people that I would describe as being good people. But we all have flaws. And we're to thank God specifically for the fact that He is good. Now, now, how does that help me to live a life of satisfaction? If I'm going to, because people are asking, how, how can I be satisfied in my life? Well, it, it helps me because you see, it lays the foundation for trust. It helps me to know that even in those times when life is confusing, that I worship, I worship a God that not only knows what He's doing, but He's also going to do the right thing for me. He's going to do the right thing in, because it's the right thing to do. That's the kind of God we serve. He, we serve a good God. But not only that, God loves you. The psalmist said, His faithful love endures forever. And when we talk about God loving, we're talking about Him doing something that comes completely natural for Him. God not only loves, but He Himself is love. He is defined by His love. It isn't just something that He does. It is something that He is. In 1 John 4, 8, it says, But anyone who does not love does not know God, for God is love. Now, now I couldn't honestly make that statement about myself, nor you could make that statement about yourself, because there's times in our life that we sin. We're not lovely sometimes. We have the ability to love, but we're not defined by love. No one would look at us. They wouldn't say, Now, Tim is love. Tom is love. And the reason that they would do that is because that we're not always a lovely person, are we? But God is, and God does. And the good news is that he always, always, always loves you. No matter how down, no matter how depressed that you might become in your life, no matter how unlovable you may feel, the fact of God's love for you is ever there. It's ever-present. God is love. But not only that, God has redeemed you. I hope that everybody in the place can say, yes, God's redeemed me. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ and you know in your heart that you have been covered by the blood of Christ, you, you go to that day in your life and you know that God's made a difference in your life and you've asked him into your heart, you've repented of your sin, you have something to be excited about. You are redeemed. In our text, it talks about a God redeeming his people from their enemies, if you'll notice in this text, and that is something that God did, often did. But under the, under the new covenant, when we speak of redemption, we're usually talking about a much greater truth. Jesus had redeemed us from the punishment that we deserve. Why? Because of the sin that we've committed. And if you're a Christian today, you have been redeemed. 
because of our sin, because of the rebellion against God, we had been cursed. But through the cross, Jesus has removed that curse, and he's paid that price for redemption, and Christ has rescued us from that curse that was pronounced by the law. And when he was hung on that cross, he took upon himself the curse for our wrongdoing. And for it is written there in the Scriptures, in Galatians 3.13, cursed is everyone who hung on a tree, on a cross. If you've placed your trust in Christ for your salvation, then you're not going to face eternal death or hell or damnation. You're not going to do that. And so the price has been paid, and you've been redeemed, and, and therefore from that penalty. And so how much more satisfying can life get than knowing the truth? No matter what happens in the here and now, no one can take away your relationship with Jesus. I don't care how many... We, we're having religious oppression, and we t heard about this week in the former Soviet Union. I don't care how much the deepest, darkest places of this earth hate Christians. They can never take away the fact that if you've been redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ, they can't touch that. No matter what happens, no one can take that relationship away. Whether you get that promotion or not, or whether she says, yeah, I'm going to marry you, or no, I'm not, or whether life is filled with health or sickness, no matter what circumstances may come in your life, you can always rest in the satisfaction that God is good and that God loves you and that God has redeemed you. Can we really ask for more than that? But second of all, how can I live a life of satisfaction? Well, we should rejoice in sharing the story that you have with others. Has the Lord redeemed you? If so, you need to speak out, tell others that he's redeemed you from the life that you used to live. One of the most satisfying things that we can ever participate in is the sharing of our faith with other people. Even back in the Old Testament, we're told to speak out about what the Lord has done for us. In the Old Testament, and if you've never shared your faith, then you just don't know what wonderful blessing or the feeling of satisfaction that you can have that comes from sharing your story. And you have a story. I know that this one is from those things that most believers are scared to death of, but it doesn't have to be that way. You know, when you begin walking in the confidence that comes from recognizing the depth of what God has done for you, it's going to become easier for you to share your story. So, there are two primary ways that we share our story with other people. Two ways. First of all, you share your story by the way that you live your life. How you live your life. You know, we're called to live like people of faith, and people of faith are people who, they're going to live their lives that are patterned by the example that was set by none other than Jesus. And so our job is to share the love and the concern and compassion with other people. And this is going to have more of an impact than any sermon that I could ever preach in this pulpit or anywhere else. It's the life that you live. They expect a preacher to do something. Well, they're supposed to set the example. But when you go out and you live your life and you set that example, they will take note of that. Edgar Guest wrote a poem, and I want to read it for you. And it's called, I'd Rather See a Sermon. And I want you to hear this. It says, and I think it fits well with what we're talking about here. I'd rather see a sermon than to hear one any day. I'd rather one would walk with me than merely tell the way. The eyes, a better pupil and more willing than the ear. Fine counsel is confusing, but examples always clear. And the best of all the preachers are the men who live their creeds. For to see good put in action is what everybody needs. I soon can learn to do it if you'll let me see it done. I can watch your hands in action, but your tongue too fast may run. The lectures you deliver may be very wise and true, but I'd rather get a lesson by observing what you do. I may misunderstand the high advice you give, but there's no misunderstanding how you act and how you live. When I see a deed of kindness, I'm eager to be kind. When a weaker brother stumbles and a strong man stays behind just to see if he can help him, then the wish grows strong in me 
to become as big and thoughtful as I know that friend to be. And all travelers can witness that the best of guides today is not the one who tells them, but the one who shows them the way. One good man teaches many. Men believe what they behold. One deed of kindness noticed is worth 40 that are told. Who stands with men of honor learns to hold his honor dear. For right living speaks the language which to everyone is clear. Though an able speaker charms me with eloquence, I say I'd rather see a sermon than to hear one any day. And it's true. I'd rather see a sermon lived out. Edgar Guest, 1881 to 1959, wrote that poem. The second way that we share our story is that we share it through the things that we say with our mouth. With that verbal communication. Notice, now I, now I realize that you, I just told you that living your life is the strongest way that you can do things. I understand that. But there needs to come a time. It does. There needs to come a time that we literally tell people with our mouth. And being kind is important. Being compassionate is important. It tells people a lot about who we are. It, it, uh, it tells them about that we belong to Jesus. And at some point, we need to open our mouth and we need to share the fact that we are a lost sinner, and that we were away from God, but he has saved us by that sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And so if you've been a living example of Christ to those people in the past, they're, they're more than likely, they're going to be willing to listen to your story. I think you have to gain people's trust. And if that person happens to place their trust in Jesus Christ, then therefore you're, you're going to have a satisfaction beyond anything that you've ever known in your life. What would it be like for somebody to walk up to you and tell you, I've watched you live your life. I have observed. I don't know what it is you have, but I want some of it. Have you ever had anybody to tell you that before? I remember in North Carolina, when I lived in North Carolina back in the mid-'80s, there was a man I was working for a Christian camp. And this the guy's name was Pierre Tooks, and he had a voice that was out of this world. He sounded like Larnell Harris. He was unbelievable. And I had been working, and this guy was from University of Louisville that was working with us. We Five of us lived in an old house and on the campus there at Crestridge Girls Camp, Southern Baptist Camp, and we were working that summer as students. And I'll never forget, Pierre lived in Atlanta, and the guy named Rich was just, he was a bully, and he intimidated people, and he was, and he was supposedly a Christian, but he was full of arrogance. And, I, and, and he was just on me all the time, constantly. And there was one day, I was, and I stayed by myself a lot because uh, I just did. went and played basketball at the gym on my day off that they would give you. And one day, Pierre Tooks walked up to me, and he looked at me. And he said, I've watched how Rich has treated you. And he said to me, he said, I don't know what it is, this, but whatever it is that you have, I won't. I said, I'm just living for Jesus, and I'm trying. He said, but you never snap back at this guy. And you, you never get in a fight with him. He said, but yet, you show love to that guy. And I had a chance to witness to, to Pierre. And something happened to him that summer. Something changed. I don't know. I don't understand. I didn't say that for me to be the glory of the story, so to speak. I'm just simply saying that people do watch our life. There's a third step. If you're going to live a life of satisfaction, you need to rest in the knowledge that God is always present. No matter what's taking place in your life that's causing you dissatisfaction, you need to learn to rest in the knowledge that God's not going to ever leave you. You know, sometimes you'll go through trials and you're going to go through tribulations. But God said, I'm going to go through them with you. I'm going to walk with you. And there's three promises that I want to look at briefly that I think that will help you because, folks, I've struggled with this myself about finding satisfaction. One of the hard things for me is to do exactly, and, and what Beth Moore said yesterday, I sat with tears streaming down my face when she talked about hanging your harp up. That was, that's me right now. 
you've done exactly what you were told to do by God. You can ask some of the ladies what she meant by that that went to that conference. Talking about God's people there hung their harps up and walked, wanting to walk away. And trying to find satisfaction in your life. There's three promises that I feel like that has helped me that I want to share with you. The first promise is this, that he's going to always be there for you. In Deuteronomy 31, 6, Moses told Joshua, he said, So be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid and do not panic before them, for the Lord your God will partially go ahead of you. He will neither fail you nor abandon you. Deuteronomy 31, 6, he will always be with you. He told his disciples that he did something very similar. Jesus in Matthew 28, 20 said, Be sure of this, I am with you always, even until the end of the age. Some translations say end of the world. Matthew 28, 20, God will never leave you, nor will he forsake you. He will always be there for you, even in times of dissatisfaction. And during those very times, if you rest in this knowledge, that you'll find that very soon the dissatisfaction you feel will begin to dissipate. He's going to always be with you. There's a second promise, and that is he will always hear your prayers. Matthew 6, 6. But when you pray, go away by yourself and shut the door behind you and pray to your Father in private, and then your Father who sees everything will reward you. There will be a time in your life that you will have an innermost need. And we can rest in the fact that God is there to hear your petition. And he'll hear your confession. He'll hear your pleas. And we need to realize that. There will never, never, never come a time when you cannot lift your voice to God in prayer. The third promise is that he will always know your heart. God will always know your heart. 1 Kings 8, 39. Solomon prayed, Hear from heaven where you live and forgive and give your people what their actions deserve. For you alone know each human heart. Again, for you alone know each human heart. Is your heart filled with dissatisfaction right now? God understands. And God knows. Perhaps your heart is empty this morning. Maybe it's inflamed. Maybe it's filled with fear. A lot of people are there. It's filled with terror. God knows what's taking place. And, and there's never a feeling, there's never a thought, there's never an action that, that you take that God does not know about. And we can rest assured in the fact that God is always present and that He cares and that He understands. We want to end the same place where the psalmist did. And it says, For He satisfies the thirsty and He fills the hungry with good things. What am I saying? I'm simply saying that you can live a, a satisfactory life that God has promised if you'll just place your trust in Him. I didn't say there wouldn't be pain, but God will be with you. You can live a life of satisfaction. Are you ready to do that today? Are you ready? Let us pray. Father, how many people spend long, lonesome nights in the stillness and the darkness and pondering and wondering, is God there? Does He even care? Does He listen to me? Lord, we're reminded through Scripture that we've just shared that You not only care, but You'll never stop loving us and that You'll walk with us through that time Father, I pray today that we would find satisfaction in our heart. There's so many people today that are walking as an empty shell. And their life is a reflection of, of sadness and dissatisfaction. Father, there's probably a lot of folks on these pews that their life is being lived dissatisfied. They've not found happiness. And they've lost their joy. And because of that, they've lost their way. 
Father, I pray today they would find their joy again, the joy of their salvation. Lord, their joy may have been snatched away because of sin committed in their life. It may be because of circumstances that they have faced and are continuing to face. And it may not be because of their doing. It may be because of life itself or something that someone else has done. But Lord, help us to remember what you've told us in your word. That you're there, you love us, and you'll never stop loving us. I pray we would truly find real satisfaction in nowhere else but Jesus. Lord, help us to be found faithful to the very end. Lord, I know of seasons of dissatisfaction that we all experience, but through it all, help us to be satisfied that we have been redeemed and that we've got that story to tell. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to ask if you would to please stand. You might need to come down here this morning and just pray at this altar.